Hey y'all, in today's video let's talk about cyclomatic complexity. What is it and how does it help us write better code? So first of all, cyclomatic complexity is a metric that helps us indicate uh, the complexity of our program. It can be simplified even to the amount of branches in our code, which in turn can result in the amount of unit tests that have to be written for a given method. But to have the full picture of why cyclomatic complexity matters, let's talk about legacy code and how does it even come to existence. So, legacy code is a code that we have little to no confidence in updating. But given the amount of legacy code present in our code bases that we work day to day with, you might think that <laughs> someone is just pushing legacy code and you just don't see it and then it just overflows the whole code base and then it starts to rot. But it's simpler than that. We produce code that is of normal quality and we don't see the problem that it will blow up in our faces after a certain amount of time. It's not even the fact that the code is larger and the, the amount of lines in the code base is increased, but the fact that, the, uh, that we don't have the full clear picture of the whole code base. And once it starts interacting with more and more services, once more and more branching in our code starts, we lose that confidence. It can be amplified because of the lack of unit tests, but they are just the symptom of the underlying issue that we see in our methods in the code that we are working with, which is the cyclomatic complexity of it increased. So I hope you can agree with me that legacy code is not a code that interacts with some older version of database or some older framework, but rather a code that does 10 hundred things at once and you don't know where to even start to dig into it. That's why the book How to Deal with Legacy Code just basically states over the whole content of the book, write unit tests. And you have to write a lot of them because this code probably will do a lot of things and you might lose some of the details that it does. That's why it's better to leave it and rewrite it and understand the whole picture. So. To prevent that, to prevent your new code from becoming legacy code in a couple of years, you have to deal with it somehow. And since you won't know if your code base is becoming legacy until it's too late, you have to prevent it somehow. That's why you have to choose some sort of measurement that you want to keep track in your code base and based on that make some sort of decisions on refactorings. So off the top of my head there are a few measurements. One is lines of code, but it is inevitable that your code base will grow if your program is successful. Some others may include lines of code per method or per class, but they are still not giving you the full picture and they won't give you any meaningful details on your actual logic. You have to be warned that there is no fits all solution here when it comes to setting the threshold in your code base. If you're working with an already large code base, you might use a number like 15 or 10 because uh, at the start you just want to gently introduce it. But I think that in its most efficient state, it should be set to 7 as it's shown that our brains cannot handle much more than 7 branches at a time. And it can be drawn <laughs> like this set of hexagons here, which nicely represents our memory where we store each of our branches here and uh, we can still remember what they are doing exactly. Once we go more than that, we may start to lose some information while working on a given method. And I think that it is important to have a full context while working on a method. So let's see how we can apply refactorings to methods that may exceed such threshold. So I have here our bookshop example that we were exploring also in our previous videos and we'll be working on the create handler of book uh, that just accepts the DTO, validates it, and then saves it into a database. As you can see here, uh, the cyclomatic complexity of this uh, method is set to seven. So let's count it to see if we fully understand the meaning behind it. So first of all, the happy path is a one. It, Whatever method that does anything has a cyclomatic complexity of one at the start because it has one branch, it has to return something. So in this scenario, this is the last call, this is the, the first branch here. Uh, and then from the top, if the command uh, title is null, then we have a second branch where we return an exception, same for description. And if we want to publish something in the future, 
we have our fourth branch that throws an exception and then when we see that the language is, is not supported in our shop, we just don't uh, want to sell books with other languages for now, we have our fifth branch and we return an exception. Then our domain logic is that if there is a book with that title, it cannot be sold in our book store. So we have to, uh, we have a sixth branch and the seventh one, as you can see, because there the cyclomatic complexity is seven, is a little more tricky what it is said here, uh, this is actually an if statement in disguise. We have a cover type uh, that can be saved into the database, but if it's null, then we save unknown. So this is our seventh. And just to uh, show that, let's remove that for now. And as you can see, our, uh, our cyclomatic complexity is down to six. So I have visualized our code that we were exploring before into this little graph here. As you can see, we have the uh, validation logic, we have the duplicate book logic and the cover type called a sync operator and our happy path as well. The question is, what will happen if we want to add anything into that method? If we want to validate one more field or if we want to add one more domain logic uh, to our code? Well, we will have to somehow extract some pieces of logic together and uh, make room in our uh, graph here to accommodate for the new checks. So a clear pattern here emerges. We have our validation logic. Uh, those four can be probably put together into a separate method and then we'll have freed up at least three spaces for a new branches. Because how it works is that every branch in itself can contain another set of branches because if we want to focus on that particular branch we'll just uh, navigate to it and then we can clear our memory and start at the beginning. So as you can see, we'll be exploring such method. And then if we want to jump to a certain branch, certain case, we'll just zoom into it and we'll have another set of uh, branches here. And if we want to go even deeper, we can, we'll just zoom into that piece of branch. And as you can imagine, this is fractal. This can go on forever. Uh, this is just a visual uh, representation of it and uh, I hope that it gives you the idea that the logic is not less complex in itself but it is much much easier to understand on its own. So this is where most tutorials stop and I think that there is one more tip that you have to keep in mind while refactoring with cyclomatic complexity metric in mind. So you cannot just split your code you know however you like. It can actually make it harder to understand if you just split it for the sake of splitting, if you just have to jump around. So how to split your code? Well, you have to have cohesion in mind. So what is cohesion? It is a notion that things that belong together should change at the same rate. It's easier said than done. And this is the part that requires a lot of domain knowledge as well as the programming knowledge in general. So you have to know that if a method uses a set of properties that are independent on each other, they should not belong together. If a method performs some validation logic and some domain logic, that probably should be split as well. So in general, apply the rule with caution. So returning to our code sample here, we can definitely see that this piece of logic here can definitely be abstracted into some sort of validator. Uh, maybe let's just do that. Refactor into method, uh, validate. And as you can see, the cyclomatic complexity is reduced to three. But now you have to answer some more questions based on the uh, logic that you want to perform in your code. So as you can see, we're assigning an author here. And what if we want to check if an author is alive at the time of the publishing? So here we check if the published on is greater than the time uh, of now. So uh, you cannot publish into the future, but you also cannot publish for that authors. So would that belong here or would that belong in our uh, let's just call it domain logic here that probably will be abstracted into some separate service once it grows enough. That's something that you have to answer and that's something that you have to know. Maybe if your validation grows even larger, you will be uh, forced to uh, switch up the validation logic and split it into some sort of text fields 
and maybe your language, uh, your allowed list of languages will be pulled from a different service that will uh, contain all of your domains that you have and you're selling in. That's something that you have to know and that's something you have to agree with business on. And I hope that at least this video inspires you on how to prevent legacy code from existing. So that's pretty much it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want me to make a part two where we dig deeper into some more advanced scenarios or we check out the tooling that we can use to prevent cyclomatic complexity from rising, whether that be a Visual Studio extensions or a pull request validation on your pipelines, let me know. And thank you for watching.